I recently developed my own reverse proxy. Then I accidentally did US Google and hoped for a while that no federal police would show up to arrest me. But after that, I put that proxy to good use. But let's start at the beginning first. Have you ever wondered how platforms like Webflow, Editor X, Substack, ConvertKit and many others actually handle serving traffic and your websites under your own custom domain? Just imagine you try to build the next big thing and you want to offer people a way to add their own custom domain to your product. Whether it's a blog, a newsletter, a social profile or a link shortener under a user's own custom branding. Handling custom domains becomes a necessity faster than you might think. I had to build one when my good friend Simon Royberg asked me how I would do it. When he wrote his newest product, a link shortener, which is hosted on AWS. And this is when I went down the rabbit hole and came up with an implementation of a custom domain reverse proxy. In Rust, of course. Oh, and by the way, I am not paid at all to talk about this. I'm just happy about the solution I came up with. Before we jump into it, you might ask yourself why you just can't use AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, or whatever else to handle that for you. Well. We will go over that. But you will find out that things are not as easy or scalable as you think when you use cloud providers to handle such a critical part of infrastructure for you. But let's first find out why exactly you would need a reverse proxy at all. Some years ago, encryption was not as huge on the internet as it is today. It was perfectly fine to just serve traffic over HTTP. And most users didn't even care. All that changed when Google decided to use encryption and thus HTTPS traffic as a ranking signal in 2014. Additionally, all major browsers nowadays try to enforce HTTPS instead of HTTP. Wizard a website not served over HTTPS and your browser will most likely warn you that this website isn't safe. But how is that related to a reverse proxy? Glad you asked. HTTPS requires the use of SSL certificates and a whole certificate chain that ensures that your communication to a web server is indeed secure and that the other side is indeed who they state they are. Each domain needs such a certificate, at least if you want to allow for HTTPS traffic, of course. And sometimes you need even more certificates, especially if you don't use a wildcard certificate for your root domain. And these certificates need to be presented when a request comes in. This way, both client and server can establish a secure connection. If your platform or your product allows users to use their own domains, your servers will somehow need to react to a request that is sent to a whole different domain than your platforms, present a fitting certificate to the specific client, and do all that on demand because each request can basically target a whole different domain. All this is usually handled by a reverse proxy that takes care of incoming traffic and everything related to SSL. Now that we have this clear, we can come back to the point where Simon and I stood when we thought about what we had to do to allow users to use custom domains for his new link shortener. Our first idea was to just let AWS handle custom domains and SSL. Knowing AWS, we knew that there were two possible solutions to solving this problem with AWS native services. Application load balancers and CloudFront. An application load balancer is a load balancer that sits at the session, presentation and application layer of the OSI model. This means that it handles a higher level protocol, especially HTTP and HTTPS. And this in return means that the application load balancer already has to deal with certificate selection for any domain it handles requests for. But is there any issue? Well, it depends. One application load balancer has a limit of 25 SSL certificates it can handle. If you want to handle more, you also need more application load balancers. And thus you quickly begin to juggle around with a lot of infrastructure. The more customers you get and the more custom domains you need to handle, the more load balancers you need to deploy and also pay for. That's probably nothing you regularly want to deal with. Yes, you can automate it, but there's also quite some cost associated with it. We ruled this solution out because automating infrastructure deployments based on the number of users you have is a non-trivial task. So what about CloudFront then? CloudFront is AWS's content delivery network. Most websites nowadays are served through content delivery networks because they come with a cache, often have several locations and serve cached responses as close and fast to users as possible. But CloudFront also sits on the same OSI layers as an application load balancer and thus suffers from the same issues. Like an application load balancer, CloudFront is also a part of the initial SSL negotiation and thus it also needs to have all certificates for all custom domains a platform handles available. Often. CloudFront does additionally sit in front of an application load balancer. The latter then handles internal traffic routing, while CloudFront takes care of everything public-facing. 
Unlike an application load balancer though, CloudFront has an even larger issue. It only allows for one single SSL certificate to be added to each distribution. And this basically means that you need a fully fledged CloudFront distribution for each user who decides to use a custom domain. That's definitely not feasible for an early stage product with basically no paying users. The business would easily fall out of profitability in a matter of seconds. But isn't it bad if you can't use a CDM at all? Well, not at all is not entirely correct. The product can still offer to distribute some content over CDN. And that some usually refers to images, videos and other larger assets. The main thing the application needs to return to the client is the initial HTML. Whether it's a static website or only a skeleton still to be filled by JavaScript or sometimes even only a redirect. If you optimize this a little, the missing CDN for that part of the application doesn't hurt too much. Within that initial HTML, you can then include links that fetch assets over a single CDN under your control, which makes the critical parts of your application fast to load again. So what then? I decided to skip application load balancers and CloudFront entirely and go with a relatively naked solution. I needed a reverse proxy that took care of handling traffic and SSL handshakes. That reverse proxy needed to perform the following tasks. React to incoming requests, handle SSL negotiations, perform upstream requests to fetch data from other services or APIs, or simply perform a redirect, and return these responses to the corresponding clients. It's basically the public entry point to your application. There was, however, still one last issue to solve. How do you get a reverse proxy if you don't have a load balancer in front of it? Well, you have no application load balancer, but AWS has network load balancers that work a few layers below those of an application load balancer. To be precise, a network load balancer sits on levels three and four of the OSI layer model. It handles incoming TCP IP traffic and distributes that raw traffic to multiple origins without caring about which protocols actually sit on top of the TCP IP stack. But traffic flows through the network load balancer and is then distributed to an instance of the reverse proxy. The reverse proxy performs the SSL handshake if necessary, handles the request, and then returns the desired response. There's one problem with the network load balancer though. It just doesn't know about HTTP or HTTPS, and it just forwards raw TCP IP traffic, and it does that on only one port, which means that both HTTP and HTTPS need to be handled on the same port at least if you don't want to end up with a setup too complex. So the reverse proxy needs to run HTTP and HTTPS on the same port and handle the HTTP to HTTPS upgrade itself. Sounds complex, but it's possible. Let's jump into some code and find out how you can build a reverse proxy in Rust. This is the main function of the proxy. Under the hood, the proxy uses Hyper and Axum. One of the essential things to notice here is the call to bind dual protocol. If you still remember, listening on the same port for both HTTP and HTTPS traffic is a little difficult. All TCP packets coming in first need to be analyzed whether they belong to an HTTP or an HTTPS request. And this is abstracted away by this small crate, which is called Axum Server Dual Protocol. The next important part of the main function is Resolve Server Cert using SNI. This is a custom implementation of the Rust LS trait Resolves Server Cert but we will go over that in a minute. SNI stands for Server Name Indication and is a way for a server to choose the fitting SSL certificate for any incoming request. This implementation here basically allows us to add and remove certificates on the fly. And this in return allows us to let the proxy run, although customers might register or unregister custom domains during that time. As all this happens while requests come in, it uses a read-write lock. So the underlying hash map that contains the certificates can be locked when a write occurs, while reads can be performed nearly lock-free. The actual logic to handle certificates is then nested within Resolve, which is the function the Resolve server cert trait requires you to implement. When a request comes in, this function is called and then expects an optional certificate for the SSL connection to be returned. The whole implementation is then used within the RustLS configuration as a certificate resolver. This configuration is relatively simple, but it should be enough to give you a general idea of how this works. To handle all incoming requests, the reverse proxy only has one handler implemented for everything. Its sole purpose is to proxy all requests from a client to an upstream service. To do that, it extracts all necessary information 
and copies that over to a request, it performs itself. It then takes that response, copies all information over into its own response and then returns that to the client. You can add basically anything else here as well. If you want to collect metrics, for example, that's the point you hook into. One pitfall you can easily run into though is blindly copying over all request headers. This is why this proxy has a hard-coded blacklist of some headers that should never be sent over to an upstream service unaltered. These are things like the host, connection, content length and origin header, as the HTTP client within the proxy sets these itself. If you forward them mindlessly, you will definitely run into issues. But overall, that's a basic implementation of a reverse proxy in Rust that serves both HTTP and HTTPS over the same port. Interesting, isn't it? But let's see that thing in action. Let's take a look at the browser and see whether the proxy correctly forwards any content it receives from its configured upstream. And boom, here it is, Google Bart Proxy. But what about performance, you might ask? Well, work is a great way to see how much performance this proxy can actually bring to the table. It's just a command line interface that performs a configurable amount of requests against anything, like our proxy for example. Simply give it the URL of the proxy and ask it to perform a few requests, like a few thousand in this case. Then you fire it and... Oh, ah, wait a second. Oh, um, that's quite a nice micro DDoS against Google. Oopsie. Let's quickly forget about it and pretend it never happened. <laughs> uh, but yeah, quite fast, isn't it? Okay, but what now? Well, the last thing you need to handle is telling people to create a CNAME record for their custom domain. That CNAME record then needs to point at your reverse proxy's domain. When a client tries to initiate a request, it performs a DNS lookup, gets the IP of your network load balancer, and then sends the request. The proxy then takes care of everything you want it to do, like for example proxying Google or simply sending redirects or whatever else it is. Regarding the certificates, that is something you probably want to use Let's Encrypt for. You can use CertBot, for example, a Let's Encrypt client that supports all of the API to create and handle certificates with. One way to do it is to have a separate service or serverless function running somewhere and reacting to user requests. If someone wants to register a custom domain with your platform, that logic then runs and requests a certificate that you can place in an S3 bucket or somewhere else for your proxy to pick up on demand. Another way is to use a software as a service that offers a more usable API for Let's Encrypt or does even issue certificates itself. There are actually quite a few around that charge a premium but take care of things like certificate renewal for you as well. This, however, concludes this video. I really hope you learned a thing or two. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe to this channel because it helps massively. Until then, see you in the next video.